about Esau. And what did we learn about Esau? Anybody want to tell me something about what we gleaned from Esau and his uh, generation, his heritage, his sons? What did we learn there? He had a lot of stuff. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. It seems like uh, after, after verse uh, 36, there's not much mention of the like, True. They kind of got forgotten. And what we do know about it wasn't good, usually. Right. Yes. What else do we learn about that? He had a lot of kids. He had a lot of kids. Yeah. A lot of kids. Where'd they go? Did they stay with their past family? They left, didn't they? And they went to a totally different place. It wasn't the promised land. Why? Because they weren't the promised people. He saw, in fact, the Bible says, Jacob, God loved, and Esau, he hated. Interesting statement. And you got to look at that and say, why is that? Well, God knows the beginning from the end. Esau was not a man of God. And everything we see about him, he was not a man of God. We see him coming back. He helps bury his father with Jacob. And then he takes off and they separate. And the two, the story kind of ends there. But also... He has a lot of kids, like Lemuel said, but he also had a lot of chiefs. The, the whole heritage there that it names off, there's a lot of power. I mean, we see that when he comes to meet his brother. He has an army with him already. And we see this just multiplying. We see him becoming very powerful. Well, that fills in the prophecy to Abraham that he will be a father of princes. But that doesn't make them all good princes. And that's what we see there. Now we start this account. And it begins here uh, in chapter 37. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. It starts with Jacob. And he's not even possessing the land. He just got done talking about his brother who possessed land, who had kings, who had multiple possessions, so much that he had to go somewhere else. And Jacob looks like he missed the boat on this. Why? Why is this going on? Why is this happening? I think something that we oftentimes miss when we read this is that God is not interested in material possessions. God is not interested in greatness and power. God is doing something else here. You know what he's doing? He's working from the inside out. And if that takes a lifetime, it's okay with God. He's not interested in how great we want to be in this world or how powerful we are. And that's not even the way that we think most of the time, is it? We build our kingdoms. And God is building our heart. And that's what he's about. And that's what he's about with Jacob. You see, we think the story here that we're about this event is about Joseph. But when you read the very beginning of this, it's still about Jacob. Now, they already buried Isaac. And the story, when it says, and he died, the story basically ends. And I would like to put a little caption there. He didn't actually die till about 12 years later. I mean, he kind of flows into the story. If you look at how old he actually gets, it's putting a period on the end of Isaac. The story's done with Isaac, but he does continue on. And he probably is reaping the grief of Joseph and the sons as the grandfather looks on to the situation, but the story's not about him anymore. And that's why it said he died. The brothers buried him. Well, the, the Bible, if you're, if you're trying to get this chronological, you're going to be disappointed because it doesn't always work that way. God doesn't deal with it that way. But he, what he is dealing with is he's, the story's done 
with Isaac, and it's still continuing with Jacob and his sons. Now, one of the things that we have to understand is that the sons are seen through their father, and their father through the sons. And this is what's happening here. It's not a very good picture, is it? When you look at, he's got 12 sons, and if you want to look at percentage of how well he did, it doesn't look very good. Because the sons in this story are not very nice. And in fact, that's what we're seeing through a number of accounts. They're brutal, they're cruel, they're inappropriate sexually. There's a lot of bad going on with these kids, and we wouldn't even have this story if Jacob could trust his sons, but he couldn't. There's only one son that he could trust that the story tells about, and that's Joseph. As we read this account, now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned. So it refers to the father, but it's also put the period on the father, and it's moving on to Jacob in the land of Canaan that they did not possess yet, He's going to live in Hebron. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. And it's actually, technically, this is the history of Jacob. Now, wait a sec. We're about to talk about Joseph. And it's telling us in these verses, one and two, it's about Jacob. That's because God's not done with Jacob yet. And he's also seen through his sons. Now, if you think you're an island to yourself, you're wrong. <laughs> and in America, it's all about individuals. No, it's not. It's about families, and God works through the families, and you are responsible for your family. Now, do they sin? Yes. Are we responsible for the sins they do? No, but we're responsible for addressing the sins that they do. Yes, definitely. And a father needs to be doing that. A father needs to say, sons, what you're doing is inappropriate. Sons, straighten up. You're not trusting and following God. Not necessarily because it influences me, although it does, but because it influences the cause and the glory of our Heavenly Father. And that's what we're about. So, this story really according to the author, is about Jacob. And this starts telling us about one of his sons. His son, Joseph. So we have this incredible success of Esau, and then we look at Jacob, and it appears like Jacob's not very successful. And he's sojourning. He has a problem and the problem appears to be with his sons. So verse 2, Joseph, at 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock. Well, let's stop there for a minute. <clears throat> Tell me everything you know about Joseph. This is not, by the way, this is a story that you usually get in Sunday school, right? So you know a lot about Joseph. So tell me about Joseph. Anybody? Yes, sir. I'm having troubles hearing, so. A cistern. Yeah? Yeah? Right? Slaved in G Egypt. Good. Mm hmm. Don't in jail. Advisor to the king, second in command in Egypt. Thank you. Yes? Okay. We'll talk about that. That you and me did a play about? Say what? That we did a play about? Yes, we did a play about it at a camp. Mm hmm. Now that's all we did again. Mm hmm. Yes. Yes, ma'am. He's only 17. He's what? He's only 17, good. Yes, and he's gonna have a journey that's an incredible bad journey. It's a downward spiral. And how many years before he actually becomes out of prison and cleaned up, shaven, 
and exalted. How many years went by? Uh, not quite. It's, that's too many. 17. He's 30 years old when he finally gets out. So, say what? 13. 13, yes. 17 now, 13. So it's 13 years. He's there. But the 20, there is a 20 there. And that 20 is, by the time the good years end, it's 20 years. And so there's a parallel there of Jacob and his being gone 20 years, too. So there's a 20 there, even though it's a little bit before Jacob comes. Yes? He was the um, son of the favored wife of the years of their existence. Yes. Son of the favored wife. Yes. He's forgiving, is what you're saying? Yes. Does he have reason to hold a grudge? <laughs> He's got 17 years at least of reason. And he, sometimes you can understand why the world does things, but can you understand why your brothers and sisters do things or maybe other Christians do things? It's a little difficult then. You think they ought to know better, they ought to act better. Well, it's, you know what? We're all fallen. And we all fall back to bad stuff. Bad stuff. There's a lot more. He's a type of Christ. He got sold for a bunch of silver by his brethren. Didn't he? And he forgave. And, you know, there's another parallel. I'm sure, I don't want to go too far into this, but Jeff will probably touch it. When the two came, um, the two dreams that he had when he was in prison, one person got saved and one didn't. Those two thieves on the cross. There's a number of parallels here that goes on. And I'm sure as we go through this account, he's an amazing man. Do we know that he did anything wrong? Anything? So he was sinless, right? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, we will. Yes. And we will touch on that too as we go through this account. I, I think that's probably true. I think in his youthfulness, he got a little aggressive. So, um, but all sin and fall short of the glory of God. How did he become so righteous? Yeah. And Rachel wasn't exactly, she did some problems too. So, you know, how did that happen that he became the man, you could say, after God's heart? You know, how's that possible? There's a lot of parallels there as you go through, and things about this man, yes? Right. Yeah, and my circumstances caused me to do this. Yeah, we, we don't have those, shouldn't have those excuses that bad circumstances make bad people. No, actually it's kind of the opposite. Sometimes bad circumstances make good people. <laughs> Not the way we always think about it. Well, let's get into this account because we'll run out of time. We're already ways into it. Okay, so they... Joseph was 17 years. He was honest in the face of pressure in the, in the peers. I've taught school for a while, and I'll tell you what, kids succumb to peer pressure all the time. All the time. And it's very unique when a kid doesn't do that. And this is a unique situation. He has the brothers, except it never talks about Benjamin, the youngest, but the brothers had succumbed to peers like evil. 
And verse 3, now Israel, wait a sec, why does it use the words Israel when before that it used the word Jacob? Any thoughts? I think it uses that when it's talking about his righteousness, his turned self, when he started believing in God and God gave him a new name. Now, sometimes it goes back to his old name, and that's a little bit like us, too. We still have our old nature we struggle with. But I think here it's talking about righteousness, and Israel means God fights. He's fighting for Jacob. He's fighting for Jacob in these situations that are very difficult. I think it's why it uses the name Israel. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all the sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. Hmm, interesting stuff here. So why did he make him this tunic? And it's using the word Israel. Now, I would like to capitalize on this word tunic here because um, we're, look, we're reading the English version of the Hebrew, right? The English interpretation of what the Hebrew is talking about. And when you get into this, you're actually finding that it's not talking about a multicolored jacket. And that's what we teach in Sunday school, we teach all the kids, it was multicolored. That's not what it's talking about. It's actually long sleeves and long gown. What that was supposed to mean, and oftentimes those were multicolored, but it wasn't necessarily multicolored. The, the point here was that it was an overseer's outfit. It was long. It wasn't made for working in. The normal clothes were cut sleeves and short so that you could do hard labor. And you guys who have done hard labor would understand that. You take your jacket off, you roll up your sleeves, and you work hard because those get in the way of doing it. He was given a jacket that had long sleeves and long jackets so that it showed his superiority over others and ultimately over his brothers. Now, oftentimes those overseers would have these jackets that would show their authority, and sometimes they would be multicolored. But it, in the text, and I hate to pop everybody's bubble, but that's not what it's saying. It's a saying of his authority. And his father loved him and gave him this authority. It was almost prophetic over his brothers. And you know what? That's the first thing it showed. And it's possible that he saw, Jacob saw, it was now called Israel, and in that it's talking about his godly side, it appeared. It's almost like he's prophesying something here with his son. This son who is righteous at 17, and his brothers who, as we look through this account, are not righteous. Any questions? Yes? Yes, it was the first hate. This whole account is all sorts of hate going on here. Now, when people get something you don't like, you, you have a choice. You're either going to say, hey, that's cool, or you could hate it. <laughs> rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. How often do we rejoice with those who are rejoicing? If somebody gets something good, we say, hey, that's really cool. I'm so glad for you. Or we say, oh, I wish I'd gotten that too. I know when I worked at different places, I, there would be people that I could not do anything right in their eyes. If I got a trip, oh, he's just rich. He gets all sorts of stuff. If something happens bad, oh, he deserved it. It doesn't matter. It's always going to be turned against me. And that's what some people do. And that's what these brothers do. Now, let me touch on something else. And I'll, too many stories, but I had a great aunt who uh, in her household she was given the authority over money because she was brilliant when it came to money but what she did was she ruled the family with it and her brother older brother hated her for it 
that I could tell, and it divided the both of them because they were both trying to get authority, and they split apart. Now, my father worked for her for 30-some, 34 years. She ran that company for 75 years, worked in the company and ended up running it for 75 years, a powerful woman, never got married. Very tough, very businesslike, and very unyielding. I knew her. I worked at the company for seven years while she ran it for the five before she died. And I knew her very well. I worked for her in the yard, her yard too, taking it up. And anyway, I never knew I had this uncle. It was forbidden to even say his name until she died. And then we found out, I found out, that I had this other great uncle living in town. Isn't that amazing? These things can happen in families. And then she wanted my dad's brother to run the company. Well, he died during the war. Not in the war, but during that time. And she was disappointed. Dad was the second choice, so Dad worked at the company. <laughs> Isn't that disappointing? Your second choice. And then she, as Dad grew older, she wanted my brother, who there was eight kids of us, my brother Hal, to come into the company. He didn't want to do it. He wanted to go to the mission field. Kudos to him. <laughs> she was disappointed. And then I came into the company. I was the second choice, too. <laughs> wow, how things we weave when we begin to deceive. Ah, families. They can be a big old mess, can't they? And when you start focusing on one, it can cause a problem. But sometimes it can be prophetic. And in this case, I think it is. He gave his son this multicolored jacket. And then he sent Joseph. He was 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while it was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhad and the sons of Zephthad, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to his father. It's not all the sons, but enough of them. A number of sons, bad report, an evil report is really what it means in some texts. An evil report. They're doing stuff they shouldn't have. Don't go into the detailed stuff, but we know these boys are capable of bad stuff. They're capable of violence and they're capable of sexual sins that they should not have been doing. And he brings back a bad report. That when you tell on your brothers and sisters, it's not going to turn out well for you. The question is, is it the right thing to do? Is it the right thing to tell your parents that bad things have happened? It is, by the way. And his brothers saw their father loved him more than all the brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. So he's bringing back a bad report. They're not going to like him for that to him to begin with. Now, the whole multi brother, the multi colored tunic, which is actually a tunic of authority, they hated him for that too. So there's hate going on here toward his brothers. And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all the brothers, and so they could not speak to him on friendly terms. Now, how does it feel to have somebody tell you bad all the time? It's not a fun thing. And the question is, are you responsible for that? Or are they responsible for that? And you've got to look to yourself and say, am I doing things that deserve what's going on here? Well, in Joseph's case, he was not. He was doing righteousness. He was being honest. Was it right for the father to give him this tunic? Anybody had a thought here? Did the father have the authority to do that? Yes. yes. How old was the father? It says old age. 
What happens in old age? Should, say what? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. Good. Maybe I'll put you in the uh, memory care center. <laughs> supposed to be in age with gray hair as wisdom. And I think when it uses the name Israel is referring to his wisdom linked to this tunic. I think it was a wise choice. I think he saw prophetically what was going on. And I think he saw this son who was righteous and that he could trust him. He sent him out to see what was going on. And by the way, Joseph was a shepherder also. He wasn't even a head shepherd. He was just helping as a servant, everybody else. But he brought back the bad report. And that brought hate. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. So before he even tells the dream, it gives us a commentary on it. They hated him for the dream. <laughs> so hate number three, basically. You're building up a lot of animosity here. And he told the dream. In the first dream, there's sheaves. It's farm work. And there's sheaves that... They're, they're working in the fields, and if you know anything about sheaves, you cut the sheaves, you bind the sheaves, you lay the sheaves down, and you get a whole bunch of them, and then you stack them up, and you put them on a wagon, or however, you take them to the place where you're going to beat them up, the, get the grain off of those so that it's left with straw. The long stalks are called straw, and the Grain is called sheaves, and then you got to have to break the outward um, stuff, and that's called shaft that happens to the sheaves. Okay, that's, that's how this works. But you're laying them down. So you got a whole bunch of sheaves, and Joseph's sheaves stood up. You don't lay, they don't stand them up. It, by its own volition, it stood up. Now, have you ever taken a piece of straw and bend it when it's dried, what happens to it? It snaps, right? But these pieces of straw are bend. It's not normal. And so 11 of them bend, and one of them stands upright while they're bending to him. Do you see the analogies here? And these guys aren't just shepherders. They also did farm work. And we learned that about different ones of this family early on in history. It's not just farm work. And I bet even with your sheaves, you probably have some gardening. And I know your wife does flowers and probably some vegetables. And these guys did this stuff too. They didn't just do one thing. They did multiple stuff in those eras. And so they would understand these things. And they came alive and they bent or did homage, respect, to a superior which fits the jacket that he wears. The dream is fitting what's happening here. And that causes anger to them. And then it says, and he said to them, please listen to the dream which I have. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheep. Then his brothers said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for the dreams and the words. Now we got more hate. So what are the two words they used? Rule and reign. So rule is power. Reign, what, what do you use the word reign? If you say you're going to reign over us, what then are you? A monarch, a king. So he's got power and their kingdom. <laughs> These guys get it, and they don't like it, and they hate it. And you can look ahead. We got the rest of the story, right? That's basically what he does. Nobody else reigns. In fact, the 
The Pharaoh didn't even worry about things in his kingdom because Joseph did it all. He is ruling and reigning. He's got the signet ring of the king. He can do anything. And he actually is ruling and reigning. That's what it's looking toward. That's what this dream has, and these guys hate it all the more. It's the hate because of the dreams and because of the words. The very words that he uses. So then you got dream number two. And dream number two starts at verse nine. Now he had still another dream related to his brothers. Now wait a sec. <clears throat> Here you got brothers, they're hating you. You could tell it, you could feel this. It's been going on for a while, and there's hate going on, and it's bubbling up. <laughs> what should he have done? What could he have done? Kept quiet. kept quiet. Yeah. He could have kept quiet, right? That probably would have been a better, that's what we would have done, you know. Why get yourself in trouble? Why cause these problems? Keep quiet. But I will tell you this also. Sometimes we keep quiet. God works through the noise, too. He works through the impetuousness of youth. And I think this was impetuousness of youth going on here. I think it was enthusiasm of youth. And if he hadn't told the dream, then they wouldn't have remembered it later. So having told it, whether it was impetuous or not, it was God used it. God can use these things. So he tells the dream, and now it's a little different dream. It's not talking about farm life or earthy things. It's talking about the heavens. And the ancients used to think of royalty and power in the heavens. And so this all of a sudden took another level up when he told this dream. And he had still had another dream, and it related to his brothers that said, Lo, I have still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars are bowing down to me. Okay. So, we, we know that Jacob's still part of the story, so Jacob is the, the metaphoric, this metaphoric language, he's, he's the son. And the moon would be the wife. She's dead, but she's, there's still respect and homage that is implied here. The stars, it said 11 stars, that's pretty obvious, the 11 sons, they bow down. Well, what does that make him kind of? Thank you. <laughs> Very good. What bows down to the stars and the sun and the moon but God? And that's probably what they're interpreting this as. He got a dream. Now, was he God? No. But he was in the position of God's authority on this earth, yes. And in fact, we see a little bit of that. Um, if I can find. Anybody have a Bible? Is this church? Somebody want to read Genesis 41, 37 through 39? This is a word, a Bible drill. Genesis 41, 37 through 39. Daniel, you want to read it? You gotta be loud, son. That's I can't hear you. Can we find anybody who has the spirit of God in him? Here is Pharaoh who's identifying exactly what the me is when the sun the moon and the stars bow down to him. He's the man with the spirit of God. That's what the me is in this dream. Yes? Well, and this is amazing if we know anything about Egyptian history because Pharaoh was God. Yes. Uh -huh. So for him to say that about somebody else is very interesting. Yeah. And this man was walking 
with God behind him and in him. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, they don't understand these things. Bob is busy and this kid is totally irrespectful. Right. But Jacob saw something different in the number 11 son. And actually, God, as we look at it, doesn't always choose the first son anyway. <laughs> There's many accounts and, and points to that, like um, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael's first son, he didn't get the inheritance. And then Jacob, Jacob came after he was called the heel catcher. That's what the, the word means, and he came second. Esau didn't get all the blessings and the inheritance. Jacob did. And here is another son who is the 11th son and doesn't get it. He gets it. In fact, he's going to get a double portion. His sons will get equal portions to the other brothers. Ephraim and Manasseh get as much the equal portion as all the brothers, which kind of throws an interesting twist into future history. Because then there's 13 inheritance rather than 12. Okay? And David. David was the seventh son. David, King David, you know, they brought all the sons, and he was, none of them were chosen. It was David. He had a heart for God. God sees the inner. God works through the inner to the outward. And we see that over and over again. So then he's telling the story, Lo, I still another dream, and behold, the sun, moon, and the stars were bowing down to me. And he related to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him. Now, wait a sec. Why is the father rebuking him when he's seeing something already in his sons? He's giving him authority. He's... He's doing this. Why does the father not see this? Or is there something else going on? All right. I have a thought for you here. And as you Let's read that over again. He said, relate it to his brothers. Lo, I have still another dream. Behold, the sun, moon, the stars, and other stars bowing down to me. And as you go through it, according to this, there is actually... In the text, there's three beholds. There's, and some translations say, look, look, look. And what did Christ do when he was, he, when he wanted to really get your attention, you say, behold, get your attention. I want you guys to see this. This is really important. And I think Joseph was doing that. It's, look at this, look at this, look at this. And that's what he's doing in this dream. It's not that the dream was inaccurate. And he wanted his brothers to see it. Now, when you have somebody that doesn't like you and you're trying to prove yourself, you might keep on trying to push it. And I think it's possible that he's trying to push this dream to say, look, guys, I got the jacket, and now the dream is saying the same thing. Yes? Yes, and it could be that Jacob is responding to that, and he kind of implies that. Do you actually mean that your mother and father will do this too? But it's also his attitude, and it possibly has to do with attitude here that his father has seen, and he rebuked him for it. But you notice what it said after that, that Jacob did. Interesting little statement. And said to him, what is the dream you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow down before you to the ground? And there's kind of almost a but. And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in his mind. So the brothers took another step downward. Jealousy is another step of anger, another step of, of um, dislike. It's like the fifth time. They are spiraling downward, not to come back up for a very long time. And some question whether they were ever believers. 
But the father treasured these in his mind. Who else kind of did that? Can you think of somebody that, that had that same kind of thing happen where something happened but they treasured it? Yeah. Mary. Mary. I think that's found in Luke chapter 2. Hmm. Luke 2, 19. Anyone want to look that up or quote it? <laughs> Anyone have a Bible? Luke 2, 19. Yes, Bill? Yeah, things that were about the son that she had. And she continued to treasure those or mold them over in her mind. Think about what does this actually mean? And even though he's rebuking his son and he's wondering what's going on here, and he gave him this multicolored po power jacket. And by the way, there's another thing about this power jacket too. And it doesn't come out in our English text very well. It says that he continued to make the jacket. You know what that means? When the jacket wore out, he made him another one, and he made him another one, and he made him another one. It was the concept that he was going to keep him in it. If something happened to that jacket, it was going to get replaced. It was, he has this position of authority. It's kind of lost on our English translations. So, but there's something else going on here, and I think a little bit of it is the pride of the man. So my question then is, now he's going to go see his brothers, and <laughs> I wonder about that too. But uh, bad stuff is going to happen to him, and it's kind of a downward spiral. Have you ever read the um, legend of King Arthur? What happened to him supposedly in the legend when he was young? Anybody know? Merlin gets a hold of him, remember? He, and he makes him all sorts of different animals. It's a legend, it's not true, of course. But it's the concept that he's teaching him wisdom. But you see, that's what God's actually in reality is doing with Joseph. He's taking him through multiple things that as he goes through it, those are things that help him to understand peoples and places and things that he's going to need to know when he becomes the power of the king. And God takes him through that, and every time Joseph responds well and responds righteously. And to be a king, you have to have humility and you have to have God first instead of self. And that's what God prepares this man for. And I find it interesting that in all these world kingdoms, God puts his man in the center of things like he did with Daniel. And he's done with other people. God uses those men to help bring godliness into it. And Joseph was God's man to prepare the way for a nation to go into a kingdom to prepare them it was actually a family to become a kingdom, a nation. And interestingly, when they went to that Egypt land, they couldn't marry the people. What are these brothers doing? They're starting to intermarry, and they're starting to wear, marry Canaanite women. That's what Esau did, and it grieved the parents. Well, when they were brought down, this family of 70, they were brought down, and they could not marry them because they hated shepherders. So they only married within them family. And God kept them from being deluded into the false religious systems that were down there by that way of doing it. Well, anyway, last part of this. The brothers... First of all, the question you have to ask, 12 through 14, I'll read it. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are, you not, are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said, I will go. And he said to him, 
Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me so that he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Well, first of all, the valley of Hebron and Shechem is 50 miles. That's a pretty good trek when you're walking. It's a pretty good walk. I would have to ask, why is he not with his brothers? Why is he with his father? I think he's with his father because his father's protecting him from the evil intentions of these brothers. He's seeing the hatred. He understands this because his brother Esau had hatred for him. He gets it. I think he's wise. He's protecting him. And he's still understanding this multicolored authority that he's given his son. But he's also got another problem because he's not hearing word back from these boys. My question is, why did he have to send Joseph to find out what was going on? I don't think the brothers were telling their father what was happening because I don't think their deeds were righteous. They went and did whatever they wanted to do. The father thought they were in Shechem. That's where he sent them, right? Is that where they were at? No, they weren't. And which is 24 miles further north. So Joseph goes, and what's Joseph's answer? I will go. He's obedient. And he does what his father's intentions are. And he leaves and he goes there. And then where do we find him next? And a man found him, that's Joseph, and behold, he was wandering in the field. That's kind of the concept of aimlessly looking for something you cannot find, like you're missing something you've lost. I don't think he's lost, but he's lost what he's supposed to have found. And it's nowhere to be found where it should have been. These men aren't where they should have been, and I think they were doing what they shouldn't have been doing in this other town. And the man asked him, what are you looking for? Well, it wasn't a what he was looking for. It was a who. Now, again, why was the father sending Joseph? The welfare, right? No. There's two kinds of welfare that could be going on with these brothers. And I'm sure it was on the father's mind, both of them. The first welfare was, this is a foreign land that there's a lot of people doing stuff mean to us, and I want to protect my sons. But there's a second welfare, too. What do you think that was? It's a spiritual welfare. He wanted to know how they're spiritually doing. Are they getting into sinful things? Or are they walking righteously? Because here's Jacob. He is a man who's changed And if you're changed, you want change in your sons too, right? I mean, that's what we all want, and that's what we should want for the world around us. We want them to know God. And it's our desire to see that happen, and it's going to be on the tip of our lips, and we're looking for opportunities to tell others about God, that they can have a redeemed life as well. That's what our heart's intention is. And that's what I think his intention was for his sons, both physical, external, and for the spiritual well-being of these boys, these young men. And Joseph's not finding it, and that's, that tells a lot about the brothers. And when they saw him from a distance, behold, he came close to them. They plotted against him to put him to death. Well, they had already numerous times walked this road and we're planning this event. Not all of them wanted to put him to death, but they all had animosity toward him. I'll tell you what, when you're out looking for something and it's not findable, that's tough. He's already journeyed 50 miles. Now he's got a journey another 24 miles. It's about 75 miles just to find his brothers. And that's what he does because he's a righteous young man. What's it take for us to be righteous? 
Obedience. That's what Joseph is supposed to do. He's supposed to be obedient. He's supposed to follow, and he follows the authority that he's put over him. He's 17 years old, and he's obedient to his father. Now, my question here is, what is God asking you to be obedient to? And in this world, we all have authority over us. We need to be obedient to the authority that we have and find how can we live a righteous, honest life. And how can we seek to permeate this world with righteousness as well? Joseph seemed to be doing this in everything he did. And God honored him but not in the way that we expected and not the way that Joseph expected. Joseph was given this coat, and I find it interesting what happened to the coat. It got ripped up and shredded. Now, you've got to ask yourself, why, was that happen? why did that happen to his coat? Because that was the sign of the authority that was given to him, and the brothers destroyed that authority and mutilated it for their hatred what their father had done and God is not thwarted by that God will come through but it takes time and God's not interested in the time that we're interested in God is interested in the holiness and he took the righteous man and put him through the ringer, so they become even deeper righteous. Now, as you go through hardships, keep your testimony up. Keep walking in righteousness. Be true to the authorities that God has put you under. And honor God with everything you do. This man did. And he never let anything bring him down it was a sign where a man could go to prison and still not be in prison. It's a sign where a man could be handsome and almost beautiful and not let that go to his head. He's still true to God. And we can be as well, no matter where God's put us. Let's pray. Thank you for your watch care over us, Father, and the gifts that you've given us. And this account of a man that walked righteously and from all outward appearances didn't do very much wrong. We know that he sinned, because you said all have sinned and fall short of your, glo your glory, but he gave you glory back instead of drawing it to himself. And I pray that we will learn this and learn to be witnesses to this present age, this age that does not love you, does not care, and yet you reach in and mercifully and majestically save some. Help us to be involved with that process of harvest and love for this world. Help us to know that you are not finished with us yet, but you are still working even through situations that aren't always fun. Bless this time and your people in Jesus' name. Amen.